The following is part of Cornell Contemporary China Initiative Lecture Series under the Cornell East Asia Program. The arguments and viewpoints of this talk belong solely to the speaker. We hope you enjoy. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Cornell Contemporary China Initiative Lecture Series. My name is Mara Yudu. I'm the director of the CCDI series in Spring 2023 with the theme in general China. And I'm assistant professor teaching Tian Republic history at the Department of History at Cornell University. Launched in 2015, this lecture series has brought hundreds of leading scholars from various disciplinary backgrounds to share their cutting-edge research on China with Cornell students, faculty, and the general public. This series is sponsored by the Cornell East Asia program. Here, I would also like to express my sincere gratitude to the co-sponsors of this series in spring 2023 the Department of Asian Studies, Cornell Center for Social Sciences, the Feminist, Gender, and Sexuality Studies Program, the Department of History, IIR Schools Global Labor Institute, the Latin China and Asian Pacific Studies Program, and Cornell Society for the Humanities. Before we formally start, I want to announce our next CCCI lecture and also the last lecture of this semester. That would be from Professor Yi Ge Dong uh, from the Department of Sociology at the University of Buffalo. She's coming on May the 8th to talk about the fabric of care, women's work, and the politics of livelihood in socialist China. May the 8th would be a Monday, and the lecture starts at 4.45, uh, the same location. It's a great honor for me to uh, introduce our speaker today, Professor Matthew Summer. Um, professor Matthew Summer is a Bowman family professor of history and a bipartisan of East Asian languages and culture at Stanford University. He received his PhD in history from the University of California, Los Angeles in 1994. Since then, he has become one leading scholar in the field of social history, gender history, and the legal history of late imperial China. Among many uh, publications, there are mass read books, uh, Sex, Law, and Society in Late Imperial China, published by Stanford University Press in 2000. And recently, Polly Andrew and the White Side in Qing Dynasty China from University of California Press 2015. Today, Professor Summer comes to talk about his upcoming book with Columbia University uh, Press on transgender in Qing Dynasty China. Since spring 2022, the CCCI series have been held both in person on campus and also broadcasted online via Zoom. To those who are attending this lecture today via Zoom, please feel free to type your questions and comments to the chat box anytime during the lecture. The questions will be covered after the uh, lecture during the Q&A session. Um, and also, the video will be made available online uh, several weeks after the talk. Please feel free to share with your uh, friends and colleagues um, if they cannot make it due to schedule conflicts. Now, let us welcome Professor Summer with warm applause. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can everyone hear me? Uh, thank you, Mara. Uh, it's an honor to be here, a pleasure. Um, I want to thank my hosts at Cornell, especially Professor Du, but also Amala Lane, who's handled the logistics beautifully so far. We'll hope everything works. Um, so today I want to talk a bit about some of the material I'm going to present in my forthcoming book. Um, the title of the book is Stone, The Stone Maiden Who Became a Nun and Other Transgender Tales from Late Imperial China. And I can tell you more about the title later if you like. So, in this talk, I'm going to present three case studies from the Qing of people who were assigned male at birth, but who lived as women, while carefully concealing their male anatomy from other people. One presented themselves as a widow and had a successful career as a midwife for 30 years. Two others practiced faith healing, and they enjoyed relationships with male partners whom they served as wives. All three of these people eventually were exposed and they were prosecuted for the crime of nanban masquerading in women's attire. 
what were the circumstances of these individuals' lives, and how did Qing officials interpret their violation of normative gender boundaries? Those are the questions I will address today. Now, first of all, oops. There we go, oops, was not responding. Are we all, we're all here, okay, good. So first of all, what do I mean by transgender? Now this is a, a very fraught category today in our politics, as you know. Um, basically, I am using Susan Stryker's definition, which focuses on practice rather than any sort of constant trans-historical identity. So Stryker defines transgender people as those who move away from the gender they were assigned at birth. They're people who cross over or trans, the boundaries constructed by their culture to define and contain their gender. Um, this is a line from her important book, Transgender History. And following Stryker, other historians of this very small but rapidly growing field have been focusing really on practices rather than uh, imagining that the categories that are familiar today for identities should somehow be imported to the past. Um, if you think about it, the term transgender, in English as an, as an identity category or umbrella category for identity has been common in the United States really only since the 1990s, barely 30 years. And uh, a priority of transgender politics today is self-determination. The idea being that it is I who get to judge what my gender is based on my own subjective perception of my identity. It's not for others to label me, right? So based on that perspective and on the fact that our categories and, and labels and vocabulary are quite new, uh, historians are, they don't want to risk the anachronism of imposing these labels on people in the past uh, in times and places very different from our own. But also, I think it seems presumptuous to label people who cannot speak for themselves. Right? So instead, historians following Stryker have increasingly focused on practices, practices of movement away from the gender assigned at birth, uh, without necessarily assuming the motivation for that or the end point, or whether it's permanent or temporary. And that flexibility and focus on practice allows us to bring together an interesting range of phenomena, of behaviors, of practices, of people, uh, and to make comparisons, but also draw contrasts between different times and places in a way that's fruitful. And increasingly, um, historians use trans as a verb, as in, quote, to transgender. So Jen Mannion is one of the people who've pioneered that usage of the word. And that is how I will use it today. So before I get into the particular cases, I just want to remind everyone what people looked like in the Qing Dynasty. Um, so not everybody, of course, but here you have some men on the left and women on the right. What are the gender cues here? For men in the Qing Dynasty, um, it was the tonsure. So this hairstyle where the front of the head is shaved and the rest of the hair is grown long and braided, this was imposed on all Chinese men, except for Buddhist and Taoist clergy, by the Qing Dynasty uh, when it conquered um, the Ming Empire in the 17th century. So that was probably the most obvious gender cue that somebody was a man. Uh, in the case of women, the hair obviously was different. So if a woman, if a person had hair grown out in the front then, and not braided in this way, then they would be identified as women. Also, of course, you had bound feet in many women, not all, but many women across social classes, and the body more covered, right? So here are just a couple of shots of men and women. So perhaps you can use these pictures to visualize the people I'll be talking about. Oops, this seems to skip. Okay, good. Um, so the first case, so these are the three cases and they're all cases of the crime of nan ban uh, The zhuang, sometimes they use jia zhuang de zhuang, sometimes hua zhuang de zhuang, right? But that's the basic term, there's some variations. Sometimes it's uh, nan zhuang yu ban. But anyway, for a man to masquerade in women's attire, um, and that was prosecuted, as I'll talk about in a moment, under heterodoxy. Uh, and so these are the three cases. Uh, on the left, we have the names these individuals were given by their parents uh, when they were identified as male. And on the right, we have the names they assumed when they were living as women. So first, I'll talk about uh, Xiong Mumu. So um, in 1723, a woman aged 40 sui arrived at a village in Anfu County in, in Hunan looking for work. And she introduced herself as Xiong Mumu, which means roughly elder sister-in-law Xiong. And she was from Wuling County to the north. And she explained that she was a widow. Uh, she'd been widowed in her youth, but in order to escape her in-law's pressure to remarry and preserve her chastity, she had shaved her head and become a Buddhist nun. More recently, however, she left the temple. She returned to lay life and she was, had grown her hair back out. She claimed to be a skilled midwife and a healer of women's illnesses 
And when put to the test, this proved to be true. She was a skilled midwife. So she settled down and she became a popular figure in her community. She was friendly, she had a good sense of humor. There was demand for her skills. Midwifery was one of the few days that a single woman might make a living in Qing society. And Xiongmumu was successful and provided services in this village and nearby villages. And she was able to earn quite a bit of money. So after three years, she had saved enough money to adopt a young landless peasant as her son. Uh, this was supposed to be a jizi to carry on the family line of her dead husband, quote unquote. Um, and then she also paid for him to take a wife. And then that couple, her son and daughter-in-law, adopted a son and acquired a wife for the adopted son as well. Um, and she also pledged kinship with three young women in the village, taking them as her ganyuar, so her dry daughters. Um, this is a kind of fictive kinship popular in China. Uh, so in this way, Xiong Mumu created a kinship network of eight people. And from her earnings as a midwife, she paid for all the expenses for uh, the adoptions, the marriages, and so on. Now, the foundation of her household was land. By the time of Xiong Mumu's arrest in 1744, um, two decades later, uh, they had amassed 32 mu of paddy land and were living in a six-room house. By the er standards of the communist era in this part of Hunan, that would have qualified Xiong Mumu as a funong, a rich peasant, uh, if not a small landlord. So they were quite prosper prosperous. So Xiong Mumu also sent money back to her natal family to pay for the marriage of her younger brother, who was her only sibling. Uh, and after living in the community peacefully for 21 years, Xiong Mumu became involved in a lawsuit with the same brother. By this time, she had reached the age of 60 sui, and somehow she had stayed in touch with her natal family all along. Her parents died, but her brother, who was her only brother, had taken over their parents' land and refused to share with his sister. This angered Xiong Mumu, and she filed a lawsuit because, as she stated in her plaint, she believed that she deserved a half share of their father's estate. Now, on the face of it, if you don't know anything about inheritance practices in the Qing Dynasty, this claim was absurd because everybody knew that both in custom and law, brothers divided their father's estate in equal shares and sisters received nothing in fanjia, right? It's zhu zi, jun fen is the, is the principle. In prosperous families, something would be set aside for a sister's dowry, but in fanjia, they did not inherit property. All became clear, however. So for, for her to claim that she would get 50%, that was claiming a brother's share, but she is a sister. How could she claim that? So it's a kind of contradiction. Everything became clear, however, when her brother filed his counterplaint, his su zhuang. In fact, he explained his sister was a man and had been masquerading as a woman for the past 30 plus years. So Xiong Mumu was arrested, examined by a midwife on the magistrate's orders. The midwife reported that Xiong Mumu had what she deemed to be normal male anatomy. In other words, there was no evidence of genital anomaly or disease, um, and therefore was a man. Uh, in effect, the midwife reassigned the gender that Xiong had been assigned at birth. Now confronted with this evidence in the courtroom, Xiong Mumu confessed that it was true. Their real name was Xiong Arsheng. They had never married. They had never married, and at the age of 26, they had left home, grown out their hair in the manner of a woman, pierced their ears, bound their feet, loosely we can presume, because she was already an adult, and adopted women's dress. They provided no explanation for the decision to live as a woman, nor did they explain how they acquired training as a midwife, which is a very interesting question, because men didn't do that. The magistrate had Xiong beaten for this masquerade and ordered them to adopt male attire and tonsure and to be deported to their home county under the supervision of their brother. But the provincial governor heard about this case and he ordered Xiong rearrested. So we know this story because the governor then reported it to the Qianlong Emperor in a confidential memorial, a Zhu Pi Zhouzhe, which remains on file at the palace archive in Beijing. The governor expressed outrage at the local magistrate's lenience as he confided to the emperor, quote, this criminal Xiong Arsheng, despite being male, has masqueraded in women's attire, Nanban Yuzhuan, for more than 30 years, adopting dry daughters, Gan Yuar, and using the alias Xiong Mumu. On that basis, we can be sure without bothering to ask that he must have seduced and raped women on a routine basis. Ping ri jian wu zhi shi bu wan ke zhi. Someone who destroys family relations and injures the public morality in such an egregious manner cannot be tolerated in your majesty's sacred realm. Xiong Arsheng's crimes must have taken place in the obscurity of the female chambers. And an exhaustive investigation would involve countless people and endless trouble. Moreover, it is inevitable that some of the implicated women, upon hearing them this, 
would commit suicide out of shame. The scale of harm is truly great. So the governor promised to hold Xiong in jail, to scour the village for their accomplices, while interrogating Xiong further under pressure to ascertain what other acts of sorcery or debauchery they might, they might have committed. The governor also recommended that Xiong be beaten to death in an extraordinary punishment. Now, in contrast with, um, sorry. Um, in contrast with the governor's rather hysterical memorial, the emperor's reaction was rather mild. He ordered lenience, comparatively speaking, quote, it appears that this criminal has not yet committed any offense grave enough to warrant death. Therefore, make sure he is properly attired, tonsured as a man, and have the board of punishment send him to Northern Manchuria, Heilongjiang, to spend the rest of his life as a slave in the army. And Xiongmumbo is 60 at this point, so we can only guess how short and unpleasant the rest of their life would have been. Now, this story raises a number of questions. What motivated Xiong to live as a woman? They did so at great risk, as the consequences of exposure make clear. It may well be that if Xiong were alive today, they would self-identify as a trans woman, but that is speculation. And to be sure, the identity category of trans woman was not available in 18th century China, at least not in anything resembling the meaning that it has for us today. Be that as it may, Xiong obviously felt a powerful motivation to live as a woman and was able to live in that identity without any trouble that we know of for some three decades. In fact, they were popular in their community. But the authorities who interrogated and prosecuted Xiong all treated this as a case of a man pretending to be a woman for what they assumed to be nefarious predatory purposes. From what we can tell, Xiong was never asked about their motive for wanting to live as a woman or about their subjective consciousness at all. Rather, the governor's rhetoric makes it obvious that he already knew the only plausible motive for such behavior was to seduce or rape women. In the governor's own words, we can be sure without even bothering to ask that Xiong had committed these crimes. This despite the fact that, as far as we can tell, the investigation found no evidence that Xiong ever harmed anyone or even ever had sex with anyone. In fact, there were no complaints against them at all from their community. If it hadn't been for this quixotic lawsuit, probably there'd be no trace in the historical record this person ever lived. On the contrary, this was a popular and valued member of their community. So where did the governor's knowledge come from? Why was the governor so sure that Xiongmumu was a sex predator? Well, um, let's step back for a moment, consider how cross-dressing and the transing of gender were understood in Ming and Qing China. And I'm gonna be very schematic and brief here. There's a lot more that one can talk about, but um, so if we think of female to male passing, obviously the most famous paradigm is the woman warrior of whom Hua Mulan is the most famous example. According to this paradigm, a virtuous young woman acts out of filial duty to take her father's or brother's place in the military draft. She passes a man temporarily in order to do her duty as a soldier, always carefully guarding her chastity, staying within the bounds of propriety, keeping her sex secret. And when her duty is fulfilled, she resumes female attire as you see here, and returns home to her duty as a daughter. In other words, Mulan is an exception that proves the rule. Her gender passing is justified only by her selfless devotion to Confucian propriety. This positive paradigm illustrates, by implication, it seems to me, the dangers of violating the proper separation of the sexes, the danger that a woman might attempt to pass as a man in order to escape supervision and engage perhaps in sexual promiscuity. Mulan is a kind of exception that proves the rule. Now, it's interesting that in the modern era, Mulan has been cited as a heroine uh, and has been repurposed in a sense as a nationalist and feminist heroine, um, inspiring revolutionaries who've adopted masculine attire in order to declare their selfless commitment to performing a public role in a political cause um, and to reject the old gender system. So a famous progenitor of this, of course, was Qiu Jin, the revolutionary martyr on the eve of 1911, on the left dressed as a Western style man, in the middle dressed as a modern Japanese woman holding a bayonet, and then on the right dressed as a, as a Chinese man. Um, and she was a role model later. Then of course we have um, really from the, the uh, early women communists through the Amazons of the Northern Expedition down through the Mao era, the Iron Girls, the Red Guards and so on. We have numerous examples of this, of, of uh, women and, and girls dressing as men or even more provocative in an army uniform um, to declare their political commitment and to reject traditional gender roles. So that's one paradigm, 
for transing of gender, the female to male. Another paradigm, I would argue, is chujia, or exiting the family. Now, so here I'm talking about clergy, Buddhist and Taoist clergy on the one hand, and then eunuchs on the other, the eunuchs of the palaces in Beijing. Uh, these individuals abandon normative gender roles that are defined in, in terms of marriage and reproduction within the family. By leaving the family, literally and figuratively, they are leaving behind normative gender roles. Uh, and so I believe they fit Stryker's definition of transing gender very well. Um, not everyone agrees with me on this point, but I think if you think about the definition I'm using, they fit rather well. So, for example, clergy um, would shave their heads if they were Buddhist clergy. Um, Taoist clergy had a unisex kind of tonsure, not tonsure, but a kind of top knot they used. It's saying that, that male Taoist and Buddhist clergy are the only Chinese men who are not required to conform to the Manchu tonsure. All other Chinese men were required to conform to it. So, um, the clergy would wear baggy, gender-neutral clothing. Uh, upon leaving the family, they were given new names. Um, they were, and, and the clerical lineage would replace the lineage of their own families. Um, they were supposed to forswear sex, marriage, and procreation altogether. They lived in single-sex communities. Um, and they would undergo at least some degree of de-gender training. Um, you see this in Taiwan, even recently, when women become Buddhist nuns, they receive what amounts to a kind of defeminization training to eliminate their feminine mannerisms in speech, body language, comportment, and so on. Um, they refer to themselves as zhongxing, gender neutral. And I think this shows an acute awareness of the difference between gender as a role one learns and performs on the one hand, and bodily sex uh, on the other. So clergy, um, in the case of eunuchs, eunuchs also were required to renounce sex, marriage, and reproduction, leaving behind their families, and also normative family-based gender roles. They would join the imperial household as what amounted to slaves. Upon entering service, they experienced what some have called a rebirth and were given new names as part of a mentoring lineage of eunuchs, where senior eunuchs would mentor and socialize younger eunuchs. Eunuchs who were rejected for imperial service typically became Buddhist or Taoist clergy, as would eunuchs who retired. And there were some Buddhist temples and Taoist temples in Beijing that functioned essentially as retirement homes for, for retired uh, eunuchs. Similarly, young women who were diagnosed as, quote, shenyu, stone maidens. This was a, an anatomical condition which made it possible for the woman to be penetrated vaginally, um, and therefore they were considered ineligible for marriage. The typical way of dealing with such a woman was to make her become a Buddhist nun, or a Taoist nun, uh, in a sense making a virtue of necessity, you might say. So for both clergy and eunuchs, there was a degree of ambiguity. And in some respects, they were certainly understood to be men, or in the case of nuns, women. There's no question about that. So for example, um, in rape cases involving Buddhist nuns as victims, those were handled exactly the same way as those involving a, quote, liang jia qin yu, a wife or daughter of good family, with Buddhist celibacy being approximated to Confucian chastity. So there was an ambiguity about the gender of both clergy and eunuchs. And uh, some of this, I think, implies a distinction, again, between a sexed body and a gendered social role. For clergy in particular, it was in the gendered sense that they left the family. Also, we know that some eunuchs self-identified as men, and they found ways to have families in defiance of the rules, although that was risky. So these are two paradigms. The first is the uh, woman warrior for female to male. Then there's the chujia, the exiting the family. Um, I can elaborate on these if there's time later. Now, the... Um, Available paradigms for male to female passing were far less positively valued. The most famous, of course, is the young male actors who played female roles in opera, the dan. Um, uh, Andrea Goldman uh, has referred to these as boy actresses, which I think is a very apt term. It captures the paradox of their identity. In 18th and 19th century Beijing, these actors were the objects of a passionate connoisseur culture among elite men. And many actors moonlighted as high-end escorts and prostitutes to serve the wealthy men who admired them. Um, here you have two young actors. The one standing is a hua dan, uh, male uh, dressed as a female role. So the, these actors were the objects of passionate connoisseur culture among elite men. Many actors moonlighted as high-end escorts and prostitutes to serve the wealthy men who admired them. There was a whole kind of sex services industry around the Beijing opera. Um, in the 19th century in particular. Elite connoisseurs believe that, there, here's a famous Ming dynasty, late Ming, um, Hua Dan. Elite connoisseurs believe that these youthful actors were better able to perform and embody an ideal feminine beauty 
than, and, you know, far better and more effectively than a mere woman could. And, and here you see on the one hand the kind of misogyny here, right? Um, but also this shows that the allure of this kind of feminine beauty was artifice. The whole point was artifice, a kind of gendered performance rather than what was natural. And I think what was natural in this case uh, had no value. Nature provides just the raw material out of which culture is made. So you can think of the analogy of the bound foot or the scholar's rocks or penjing. These kinds of things are also examples um, where nature simply provides the raw material. But also it shows that the foundation of this kind of um, connoisseurship of the dan was misogyny, a contempt for real women who were seen as being unable to live up to this high feminine standard. Here's a famous one for the early 20th century. He's getting a bit long in the tooth in that picture, but he was a really handsome guy, wasn't he? Mei Lanfang, here he is performing. He was one of the si da ming dan in the early 20th century. In the early 20th century, what's interesting is that you have a kind of reinvention of Beijing opera in particular as guoju, as national opera, as part of, as a national classic that's fit to be performed in front of foreigners, for example. Um, but that required suppressing the sex industry and then suppressing the and sort of cisgendering it by getting rid of the male actors of female roles, having women trained up to perform them, and, and in a sense heterosexualizing it as well. And so what you have now is, is something quite different than what you had at its height in the 19th century. Um, and he was an example of a transition where his generation of these male performers of female roles, they were even in their 50s, they were still performing these roles. Whereas back in the Qing, in the heyday of the Beijing opera, um, these boy actresses, they would be phased out by the time they were about 19 once obviously masculine characteristics um, made it harder for them convincingly to portray the alluring uh, young woman. So he's already too old in that picture. By the mid 19th century, some of the opera troops were making more money from the sex trade than from opera, if Wu Sun Sun is correct. And, and the opera served mainly as advertising for the chimes of their, charms of their actors. Sex between males was prohibited by the Qing dynasty, but it was never all that strictly enforced. It was never as high a priority for prosecution as was female promiscuity. Safeguarding female chastity against adultery and especially rape, the chastity of liang jia qi nu, the wives and daughters of good family, was the true obsession of the Qing judiciary when it came to gender and sexuality. So this leads us to a second paradigm for male to female crossing, and this is the one most important for understanding our material today. This is the ren yao, um, and uh, the Renyao was a hypersexual, shape-shifting sorcerer or monster who preyed upon chastely cloistered women. Now, there are lots of variations, but the locus classicus for this paradigm in the Mingqing era was the infamous case of Sang Chong. Um, if you read the, the Ming Shi Lu, the veritable records of the Ming Dynasty, there was a man named Sang Chong, and he's portrayed as a man. He was from Taiyuan Fu in Shanxi, and he was executed by slicing Ling Chi Chu Si on the orders of the emperor in 1477. As a youth, Sang Chong had apprenticed himself to a master sorcerer who taught him how to perform women's work, such as embroidery, and to masquerade as a woman, a woman in order to seek employment in the female quarters of proper households, teaching the young ladies how to sew and so on. Having insinuated himself among the women, he would then proceed to seduce them. And if they resisted, he would use black magic to subdue them and rape them. So according to the Ming Shi Lu, Sang Chong later recruited seven disciples of his own to carry out these debauches over a wide geographical area. And supposedly by the time he was arrested, Sang Chong had supposedly seduced or raped more than 180 women over more than 40 counties across Northern China. He was finally exposed, supposedly, when a man tried to rape him, exposed his fraud, and turned him into the authorities. His accomplices escaped. Now, this notorious case was widely reported and elaborated. And over the next three centuries, it inspired many, many, many fictional accounts, some by famous authors like Li Yu, Pu Songling, Yuan Mei. If you've read Liao Jai, then you've read about this, um, or Zibu Yu. Um, in some accounts, Sang Chong and his disciples were literal shapeshifters. They could actually switch anatomy from male to female. They had trained themselves so that their penises could be retracted in their bodies and then pop out as necessary. Um, and they could, so they could facilitate their masquerade in this way. Um, in some scenarios, they would use knockout drugs, um, was it Meng Huan Yao, um, along with black magic as a tactic for rape. But in all of these accounts, the Ren Yao, this figure is a hyper-masculine sexual predator who masquerades as a woman for the sole purpose 
of worming his way into the female quarters of good households in order to have sex with women. So when Qing Dynasty jurists encountered cases of Nanban Yuzhuang, men masquerading in women's attire, their investigations were informed by this paradigm. This is what they assumed they had on their hands. Even when individuals under interrogation admitted to having enjoyed sex with men, the magistrates were not interested. They even showed impatience that this was an irrelevant distraction. Instead, they would demand to know, often using torture, how many women did you seduce? How many women did you rape? According to this paradigm, male to female transing had nothing to do with gender inversion, gender dysphoria, homosexuality, even femininity. It was all about male possessive desire and sexual aggression against chaste women. Now it's intriguing, as I'm sure some of you have noticed, it's intriguing how closely this paradigm of the cross-dressing sexual predator resembles the paranoid fantasies that inform transphobia in the United States today. This modern transphobia is especially hostile towards trans women. A classic example is the portrayal of trans women as insane serial killers in popular Hollywood movies like Psycho, Dressed to Kill, Silence of the Lambs, and so on. There's a long list. A more recent example from American politics is the effort to ban trans people from using um, the public restrooms that match their gender identity because of the supposed danger that deranged male sex predators in drag would pose to the safety of little girls. That's the rhetoric. What these manifestations of modern transphobia share with the Sang Chong paradigm and with the assumptions of Qing Dynasty officials is the paranoid fantasy of the trans woman as a dangerous predatory fraud who poses a threat to real women. Right? Incidentally, the paradigm of the cross-dressing sexual predator had a parallel in the way clergy and eunuchs were perceived. And this, again, I think reinforces my sense that they should be seen as a kind of gender transing paradigm as well. So for example, clergy were stereotyped in popular culture as wolves in sheep's clothing, who only pretended to be celibate and transgender. In fact, they were a bunch of lechers, meat-eating, alcohol-swilling lechers who wanted women. Mm -hmm. right? um, so it strikes me that the stereotype was actually a variation on the paradigm of the cross-dressing sexual predator. And so there are many examples in fiction, but also in late Qing Dynasty newspaper accounts in Shenbao, or in this case, Dian Shi Jai Hua Bao, that portray male clergy disguising themselves as women for the purpose of sexual predation. Sort of brings together both paradigms into one. So here is this case. This is from Dian Shi Jai Hua Bao. Yao Sang Nan Zhuang Niu Ban Yu Jie Shi Zhong. So he's been arrested. Um, and so the Yao Sang is on the left, dressed as a woman. And on the right is the man who is an accomplice and they're being, they're, they were beaten and they're being paraded in this, um, this uh, jia hall for two people to show the masses, to show the people. Um, and they were prosecuted in the French concession, which is why you have a French officer there, but they were prosecuted by the Chinese magistrate in the mixed court. But there's actually a remarkable amount of this kind of thing in Shen Bao and Dian Zhai Hua Bao. You get the impression that it was not at all uncommon for people to be picked up on the streets in Shanghai um, and, and uh, prosecuted for cross-dressing. Uh, I think that this sort of thing was a lot more common than, than we would probably assume. Here's another case, Lao Dao Zhuang Yu. So there was an elderly Taoist who pretended to be a woman, um, arrived at this home of a, a young woman, a new bride, very beautiful, her husband's away on business, and he introduced himself as her husband's aunt, and she lets her in and um, lets her stay for the night. In the middle of the night, tries to rape her. He's exposed, though, and here you see the... Um, virtuous young wife pointing and denouncing him, and he's been exposed to show his hairy legs, his hairy chest, right? And uh, anyway, he was put to death in the Zhanlong. Um, not a nice way to die, um, at least according to the newspaper. So a similar fear attached to eunuchs, in other words, that an uncastrated male might sneak into the palace to have sex with the emperor's woman. And if you know Shi Ji, you know the story of Liu Bue, um, some of you probably know what I'm talking about, the story of, of the fake eunuch Lao Ai, um, who was smuggled into the Qin palace by Liu Buwei to have sex with the queen dowager. Um, this is the kind of locus classicus of this paranoid fantasy of the intact male pretending to be a eunuch. Um, a corollary was the fear that a real eunuch might somehow be able to regenerate his genita genitalia by occult means. Um, so there are all these stories supposedly of eunuchs eating human fetuses or cannibalizing young boys in order to regrow their genitals. Um, and so in the Qing palace, twice a year, all eunuchs were subjected to a strip search and a detailed physical examination just to make sure that neither of these things had actually happened. So this paranoid fantasy about the fake eunuch was there right, right at the top. Even the cross-dressing actors of the, 
of the um, opera were to some degree objects of suspicion. The idea being that they could, they were like femme fatale, right? They could act as spies, manipulating their elite male patrons, who were often government officials, and learning confidential information from them. Now, if we look at Qing law, the Ming and Qing codes contain no law against cross-dressing per se. In fact, this phrase, nan ban zhuang, a male masquerading in women's attire, uh, does not appear in either the Ming or the Qing code, which is not to say that such behavior was permitted. Uh, when these cases came to official attention, they were prosecuted under this, under this statute, the um, Zuo Dao Yi Duan Shan Huo Ren Min. Um, this is the using heterodox doctrines to provoke and deceive the people. Um, this statute appears in the Qing Code's chapter related to the Board of Rights, the Li Bu. <coughs> and uh, the concept um, seems rather vague, but the statute, its commentary and code case books list a number of specific crimes that it covered. So participation in heterodox religious sects, but also practicing black magic, engaging, engaging in spirit possession and making incantations, cheating people out of their money through quack medicine, um, faith healing, other confidence schemes. The penalty was death by strangulation for the main offender and life exile or military slavery for accomplices. Mm. For our Chinese readers, here's the text of the statute itself. The key phrase is, so the Ming statute, the parentheses, those brief sections were added in the Qing. I'm gonna move on here. This is part of the ideological foundation, of course, without going into too much detail, this is from the Book of Rights, the classic phrase that some of you probably know, nanyu uh, yobie, when male is distinguished from female, then father and son will draw together in affection. When father and son draw together in affection, a sense of moral duty is born. When a sense of moral duty is born, the rituals appropriate to human relations will be created. Once the rituals have been created, all things will find their proper place. And here's the key. Without distinction between the sexes, there's no sense of moral duty. And that is the way of animals. Wu bie wu yi qin shou zhi dao ye. So this is the just one famous text that um, I think is foundational for the perspective um, that this is heterodoxy. As the Board of Punishment observed in an 1819 case, quote, in the past, this board has adjudicated cases of men masquerading in women's attire in the following manner. In any case that involved the violation or seduction of women or swindling the common people out of their money, the offenders have always been sentenced to strangulation according to the statute against heterodoxy. So cross-dressing was linked to the statute by a web of associations between deceit, seduction, swindling, and black magic. The underlying premise was the Renyao paradigm, the Sangchong paradigm that understood the sole plausible motive for male to female passing as a desire to seduce and rape women. It was a fraud, in other words, for predatory purposes. So again, the Book of Rights explains this, the foundation of a civilized moral order was the distinction between the sexes and their socialization into respective gendered kinship roles structured by the rites or rituals, in other words, the norms that properly govern human relations. So schematically, ideally, males as they mature, they would pursue a centrifugal category, whereas females pursued a centripetal category. Ideal at about the age of six, boys would emerge from the inner female quarters of the household to be educated under the supervision of their father participate in the worldly sphere of work and state service. At the same age, girls would have their ears pierced and feet bound and thenceforth would be increasingly cloistered. Male and female then would be reunited upon marriage and orthodox gender relations were defined by normative mar marriage rules. All women were to be wives and mothers, all men were to be husbands and fathers. And in the 18th and 19th centuries especially, female chastity was a central value defined by absolute lifelong loyalty of a woman to one husband and from that standpoint, normative sexual relations were defined as conjugal relations, all others being prohibited. Again, as the Board of Rights warns us, quote, without distinction between the sexes, there is no sense of moral duty, and that is the way of animals. Qin shou zhi dao ya. Now, it's interesting that the, ch the Qing Code's chapter on sex offenses, the fan jianmen, which is in the Board of Punishment section, it contains no mention of cross-dressing. So the fact that male to female crossing was punished as a form of heterodoxy under the Board of Rights suggests the fundamentally cosmic danger implied by the violation of gender boundaries and categories uh, that this behavior constituted. 
Now, if we move on to our second case, this is about Zhang Yaogunyang, which means um, younger daughter Zhang. In 1818, a homeless beggar couple, uh, husband Wang Shixian and wife Zhang Yaogunyang, were arrested in Quezhan County, Henan, and deported back to their home province of Hubei, where they were held in custody at the provincial capital. It's not clear why they came to attention of the authorities, but suspicion focused on the wife, Zhang Yaogunyang, and a midwife who examined John for the arresting magistrate reported that this individual had what she deemed to be normal male genitalia. On exposure, they confessed their original name to be Peng Ziren. So in Hubei, a county magistrate interrogated the defendants, found them guilty of various of offenses, and reported his findings up the chain of command. But the provincial judge, his superior, rejected his report, ordered him to retry the case. The magistrate's second attempt satisfied the provincial judge, but that was then rejected by their superior, the provincial governor, who reprimanded the magistrate, said there must be more crimes here that you haven't found out yet. Try harder. And he appointed an extraordinary tribunal of two prefects to take over the case. The prefect's eventual report survived review and was approved at all levels. Now, everything we know about this case comes from this third report, which is the product of repeated interrogation over 18 months, during which the defendants came under increasingly intense pressure to confess the truth in a manner that was satisfactory to the interrogators. So it should come to no, as no great surprise that the final account largely conforms to the sexual predator paradigm that we've already discussed. As, according to the original confession, Zhang Yaogunyang, who was aged 37 sui, was a homeless beggar who wandered around Hubei and Henan. For most of their life, they'd lived as a man, but two years before, they decided to start masquerading as a woman, quote unquote. They explained this decision by saying they hoped that as a woman, they would attract more pity and perhaps more generosity. So they grew out their hair, pierced their ears, bought a tattered woman's gown and earrings at a secondhand stall, and assumed the name Zhang Yaogunyang, youngest daughter Zhang. Their chosen name is suggestive in a way that the authorities completely ignored. Zhang was actually their mother's surname. So in presenting as a woman, they chose the mother's surname over the father's. In fact, in effect, they renounced their identity as a son of the Peng lineage and all the filial duties which that entailed. But instead of abandoning kinship altogether, they chose the maternal line over the mandated paternal one, suggesting perhaps a stronger connection to their mother that they wished to honor. After a couple of years, um, Zhang encountered a beggar named Wang Shixian and they decided to keep company together. According to their confession, Wang realized that Zhang was a man in disguise and threatened to expose them. But Zhang offered to let Wang have anal intercourse with them in exchange for discretion, and then Zhang agreed to serve as Wang's wife forever. A striking feature of this relationship is that Wang played the dominant gender and sexual roles as Zhang's husband, but also as a penetrator in their sexual relations, despite the fact that he was seven years younger than Zhang. In addition, Zhang Yaogunyang pledged themselves to a master who taught them a method of ex exorcistic healing that involved summoning a martial spirit with an incantation. Here you have the incantation. It's not very easy to translate. Um, they would utter the incantation over a bowl of water, then draw a talisman in the water with their fingers, then have the afflicted person drink the water, or they would spray it onto the injury. And Zhang used this method to treat people for snake bite. And it's interesting because in the Qing Dynasty, beggars were reputed to be snake experts. They were used for pest control. They would hunt snakes and sell them for various purposes. But also they were always brought in to treat snake bite as an injury. This was seen as their special skill. So that's what Zhang Yaogunyan did with this sort of faith healing. So this was the basic story that the magistrates elicited in the early interrogations. But further interrogation, almost certainly under torture, extracted two more details that were key. So, First of all, first of all, Zhang Yaogunyang's faith healing was completely a fraud intended to cheat people out of their money. And second, Zhang's real motive for passing as a woman was to seduce women. In fact, he had succeeded in seducing a total of two women. The first was a beggar with whom he had kept company for a few days. Another occasion, he was able to gain short-term employment at the home of a peasant, managed to seduce this man's sister-in-law. But for various reasons, neither woman or any witnesses could be summoned to testify. The only evidence was the confessions extracted under pressure. And so I personally find them rather suspect, although who knows what the truth was. It was this additional information that satisfied the superiors, the magistrate's superiors. 
So John was sentenced to immediate strangulation according to the statute against heterodoxy. Their accomplice, in other words, husband, Juan, was sentenced to life slavery at the frontier for, quote, having failed to report Panzeren's masquerade and then abetting it by posing as Pung's husband. Now, it's hard to know, it's impossible to know, how much of John's confession we should believe. There's no doubt that they and Juan came under enormous pressure to confess in a manner that would satisfy their interrogators. And the way their confessions developed over time appears to be an example of what historian Laura Stokes, my colleague at Stanford, who studies the Inquisition, has, she has called it creativity inspired by torment, where the interrogators help the person being interrogated to craft an appropriate confession by leading questions and so on. What made Pung's final confession satisfactory was the inclusion of fraudulent faith healing and the seduction of women. Those details conformed both to the paradigm of sexual predation that shaped official expectations and to the, term, the terms of the statute against heterodoxy, which specifically prohibited summoning spirits and faith healing. But also the purely instrumental motives offered for transing gender and for becoming Wang's wife seem to be artifacts of interrogation. My own guess, and it's only a guess, is that Zhang transgender became Wang's wife because those were fulfilling and meaningful things to do for them. Um, why go to such risk otherwise? But the conceptual portfolio of Qing officials did not permit them to acknowledge the reality of a transgender life. Now, the magistrate and his superiors showed no interest at all in Zhang's sexual relationship with Wang Shixian, or the fact that they understood themselves and presented themselves to others as husband and wife, beyond insisting that these facts proved Wang's complicity in the fraud. If anything, the magistrate, the, what's that? That's not me. <laughs> um, if anything, this reference to the sexual relations between the couple were an annoying distraction from discovering the truth about Peng's supposed predation against women. Now, I think there's something truly pathetic about this account. Zhang and Wang were two impoverished homeless beggars who had what appears to have been an affectionate relationship. It's not clear that either of them ever harmed anyone. Even if one accepts the dubious confession about seducing women, both of the women in question supposedly consented to his advances, their advances. The magistrate insisted that John must have seduced more women of respectable family, but John denied it, explaining, quote, I'm covered in filth, I'm a poor beggar, no young woman of decent household was willing to come anywhere near me, close quote. That sounds close to the truth to me, than this fantasy of a sorcerer wielding black magic to seduce chaste women. All right. The third case and final case, um, this is the case of Xing Shi or Liu Xing Shi. In the spring of 1807, the military police responsible for security in and around Beijing arrested a woman named Liu Xing Shi, aged 34, in a nearby village. They had heard that this woman was practicing faith healing for sick women by serving as a medium to channel a fox spirit, a huixian, uttering incantations and burning incense. So suspecting heterodoxy, the police arrested her along with her husband, Liu Liu. The police found Xing Shi's appearance to be unusual. To their eyes, she looked like a man dressed as a woman. And sure enough, a midwife ordered to examine Xing Shi reported that they had a man's body. And then Xing confessed to having, quote, masqueraded in women's attire, quote, for more than 20 years. As a boy, their name had been Xing Da. But what's interesting is that their husband, Liu Liu, expressed astonishment at this revelation. He claimed he had had no idea his wife had a male body. They'd been married for several years, but he had no idea. Um, so Xing was orphaned as a child, taken in off the street by a man named Hong Da, who provided food and shelter. After a time, Hong Da began using them, oops, sorry, began using them for sex and promised to provide for their support. So when Xing turned 16 Sui, Hong told them to grow out their hair, pierce their ears and dress as a woman in order to pose as Hong's wife and facilitate their long-term relationship. So from then on, according to the confession, Xing wore woman's clothing, stayed indoors most of the time doing women's work such as spinning and sewing and presented themselves to others as Hong's wife using the name Hong Xing Shi which means basically Mrs. Hong Ne Xing. In 1802, when Xing was 29, um, husband Hong fell ill with tuberculosis and could no longer support them. So the couple agreed that Hong would marry Xing off to another man. And so pretending that Xing was his widowed younger sister, Hong engaged a matchmaker who arranged for Xing Da to marry a laborer named Liu Liu, who paid a bride price of 25 strings of cash. 
According to their testimony, Xing was so convincing as a woman that the matchmaker, Liu Liu, and Liu's parents and older brother all were deceived. And in fact, the matchmaker and Liu's parents and brother were brought in and interrogated in the Board of Punishment. Um, and they all claimed that they thought this was a woman. They had no idea. So apparently very convincing. Now, note the double's exception in this new marriage. Husband Liu Liu believed that he was marrying a widow. He did not know that Xing had in fact been living as Hong's wife and that Hong was alive, let alone that Xing had male anatomy. So there's kind of a double deception here. Um, on the wedding night, what happened? So Xing covered up their bu bian chu, their inconvenient place, and told their new husband that because of an illness, they could not have vaginal intercourse and offered anal intercourse instead. So Liu Liu believed the story and consummated their marriage by penetrating Xing anally. And from then on, their conjugal relations always involved anal intercourse. Now, two years later, Xing Shi was visited in a dream by a Huxian, a fox spirit, who had chosen them to act as their medium in order to cure women's illnesses. Xing announced this fact to their husband and in-laws going into a trance so the fox could possess them and speak through their mouth directly to the family. Um, much intimidated, Liu Liu acquiesced to this plan, he agreed, but his parents and brother were shocked and horrified and they forbade Xing Shi from proceeding. So a row ensued with the fox spirit possessing, uh, Xing, possessing um, Xing Shi, causing a great deal of trouble, sort of trashing the house. And Xing Shi then compelled their husband to sever ties with his family and move out to live on their own so that Xing Shi could pursue their new vocation as a spirit medium and healer. Now it's interesting, from this point on, Xing Shi was the head of household, clearly in charge of the agenda. And Xing Shi stopped having sex with the husband Liu Liu at this point also, no more sex, and devoted themselves entirely to serving the fox spirit. And it's clear that this new vocation as a medium empowered Xing Shi in a way that transformed their marriage and put them in charge of their husband. So Xing Shi set up an altar in their home with a spirit tablet and a painted image of the fox to worship. And when women fell ill and asked Xing to treat them, Xing would go to their home burn incense and channel the fox spirit. And then the spirit would speak through Xing and question the patient and diagnose their malady. And then Xing Shi would come out of the trance and prepare a mixture of tea and other ingredients as medicine for the patient to drink. And husband Liu Liu acted as their assistant. And for each session of healing, Xing Shi received a couple of hundred cash, not a tremendous amount of money. It's like a couple of days wages for a laborer. And they had been practicing healing in this manner for several years when arrested. But Xing Shi and Liu Liu absolutely denied having used Xing Shi's masquerade for the purpose of race, raping or seducing women. The, so the police who did this first interrogation, got this first confession, um, they reported this to the Xing Bu, the Board of Punishment, basically up the chain of command. And they noted that they were very skeptical. They said, this is what they say, but we're skeptical. Especially A, that Xing and Liu never had sex, had sex with women. And B, that during their five years of marriage, Liu had never realized that Xing was a man. So the police suggested to the Board of Punishment in their report that Liu must be an accomplice, not only in the faith healing swindle, but also in the gender masquerade and in seducing and raping women, and urged that the two culprits be interrogated and severely punished. So the Board of Punishment takes over the case. And the presiding officials observed that for Xing Da, quote, to pretend to channel a fox spirit, make a fake portrait of that spirit, and to pretend to treat illnesses by looking at incense already constituted capital offenses. Note their assumption that this is all a fraud. This is not real religion, this is not real faith healing. It's a fraud to swindle people out of their money. But on top of this, Xing had, quote, dared to dress his hair like a woman's and to wear women's clothing. So it is obvious that he must have used women for illicit sexual purposes, close quote. But Xing and Liu persisted in their denials. So the examiners had them tortured with the ankle press, the jia gun, which was the authorized torture instrument for men. And under torture, after some time, they changed their story in a couple of key ways. So, a new confession. At first, Xing had indeed tried to conceal their sex from Liu Liu and persuaded him to have anal and sort of vaginal intercourse. But within a few days, as the two became more intimate, Liu discovered the truth. At first, he was very unhappy to find that his wife was a man. But Xing promised to serve him and support him faithfully for the rest of his, their lives. And Liu finally acquiesced. And then Xing seduced him um, with his charming words and manner and persuaded him into alternating sexual roles so that they would take turns penetrating each other sexually. 
<clears throat> and in this way, quote, their sexual relations became intense and passionate, and they became devoted to each other's happiness and spent every single night together, close quote. Now notice, this is a very different story than the first confession, right? Um, and in the first confession, set of confessions, both testified that once Xing began acting as a spirit medium, they stopped all sexual activity, but also that Liu Liu never realized that his wife had male anatomy. So second, the second way their story changed is that Xing Shi, with Liu Liu's help, had been operating a confidence scheme to cheat people out of their money. The channeling of the fox spirit was simply a fraud. But it's interesting that under, in other respects, even under severe torture, they refused to change their story. Even under torture, according to Xing, quote, this is a summary by the Board of Punishment, he began masquerading as a woman because as a youth he was seduced into sodomy by Hong Da. This is not something he had planned on doing himself as part of some scheme or plot. He insists he has never had sex with any woman, ever, and says that given everything else he has confessed, he would have no reason to conceal it if he had done so. Why would he endure torture in order to lie? So the Board of Punishment reported to the emperor that they found this story unbelievable, but they said ultimately it's moot because they had already confessed to other capital crimes, so instead of dragging this out, let's just execute them. And so um, the board closed the case, and the emperor approved by sentencing Xing to immediate strangulation, according to the heterodoxy statute, and as an accomplice, Liu Liu was sentenced to military slavery. So I think I'm running out of time, but I have a little bit more. Is it okay if I continue? I've got a bit more, um, thank you. So there's a common theme here, as I'm sure you've noticed, of um, the common theme of, oh, just a moment about fox spirits. So as you may know, in Chinese religion, especially in North China, you have the Sidaman, these are the four animal households of these animal spirits that are worshiped by people. Um, the fox, weasel, hedgehog, and snake, with the fox being most important and powerful. And these deities are shapeshifters. They can appear in human form or in animal form. They are accessed through spirit mediums, usually women, especially the fox is usually a woman. And um, the Hu Xian Yang Yang, the most popular version of the fox spirit has powerful power to heal illnesses, usually female illnesses, and, and her mediums are women. And this religion is alive and well in China. Here's, here are two modern images of uh, Hu Xian Yang Yang. Um, she also is seen as one who can bring good fortune to families, bring wealth and so on. Um, so, common theme here, again, healing and spirit possession. All three of these individuals, Xiong Mu Mu practiced midwifery, uh, Zhang Yao Gunyang summoned a spirit for faith healing, and Xing Shi channeled a fox spirit for healing. Right? All of them engaged in healing work. So the authorities portrayed the faith healing as a fraud, right? as a confidence scheme. But if we set aside the official prejudices, the details extracted under torture, it seems obvious there must have been, oh, please don't mess that up. <laughs> Um, if we set aside official prejudices and the details especially extracted under torture, it seems obvious there must be some connection between their transing of gender and their ability to engage in these healing activities. If you think about it, both midwifery, that's the delivery of children into this world, and the shamanistic power to channel spirits, both of them involve a highly potent crossing of boundaries with powerfully gendered and symbolic implications, and also both involve great risk. Right? So Xing Shi's channeling of the fox spirit is the most intriguing example. It's also the best document. I have the most information about that one. Fox spirits have this rich role in Chinese popular religion and folklore, um, which I just talked about. All of these spirits were accessed through spirit mediums who practiced healing, divination, and exorcism. exorcism. They were capricious spirits. They could cause mischief. Um, but if they were properly propitiated, they could also do good. And the fox is portrayed as the maternal deity uh, Hu uh, Xian Yang Yang. Um, most mediums who channeled foxes were poor married women living at the bottom of the social scale. Ah, excellent, we're, we're back, thank you. But these women typically were respected in their own communities for their healing services. And hence it's not perhaps surprising that the fox spirit served as a tutelary deity for Xing Shi or that Xing Shi was able to act as a medium for such a spirit. Despite their torture-driven confession of fraud, Xing Shi's account of their work with the fox spirit closely matches the evidence gathered in 20th century um, ethnography accounts, both in the early 20th century and again in the post-Mao era um, by scholars doing field work in rural North China, including the immediate environs of 
Beijing where this case took place. And it seems to me most likely Xing Shi's vocation was genuine. And Xing Shi's religious vocation also recalls the tradition in other Chinese religious sects of male mediums who channel female deities and vice versa, during which they undergo a temporary change of gender by adopting the mannerisms, speaking in the voice of the deity. We're also reminded of the special sacred qualities and ritual roles attributed to gender variant individuals in some other cultures. There's a sort of a worldwide pattern you can find. Um, in Native American cultures, they're the people who are sometimes called two-spirit. Um, in South Asia, you have the Hydras. Both have important um, and honorable religious roles. The imperial authorities and Confucian elites viewed all of these popular religious sects with great suspicion. They often condemned them as heterodox, uh, even though as a practical matter, it was impossible to suppress animal worship and these things or spirit mediumship. One of the stock accusations leveled at so-called heterodox sects, xie jiao, was that they violated the proper separation of sexes by allowing men and women to mingle indiscriminately. There's a separate tradition in literati discourse that demonizes the fox spirit as a dangerous malevolent being, a shape-shifting sexual vampire who takes the form of a beautiful young woman in order to seduce unsuspecting men and drain them of their semen, their life force. This malevolent fox spirit reminds us a bit of the shape-shifting sorcerer Sang Chong, but Sang Chong pursued chaste women, right? That's the paradigm we're dealing with here. Um, the literary uh, paradigm of the malevolent fox spirit supposedly preys upon healthy young men, maybe a projection by the literati who wrote that kind of fiction. Um, and this image of the sexual vampire fox appears to be a feature of literati discourse that has no bearing on actual religious practice or belief among rural people. The actual religion of the fox spirit does not have this sexual vampire image. That's a product of like guai xiao shuo and that kind of thing. At any rate, Xing Shi's channeling of a heterodox fox spirit certainly confirmed the already strong prejudice against gender crossing held by the authorities who condemned her. In fact, her, their transing of gender may have enhanced their ability for this ritual role as two extraordinary abilities that paralleled and confirmed each other. Xing's male body already served as a vessel for a woman's persona. It seems a logical next step for it to serve as a vehicle for a female spirit to make itself manifest in the world. Possession by the fox would in turn have confirmed Xing Shi in their role as a woman, but it also clearly empowered them vis-a-vis -vis both their family and their community, making them a figure of authority who dominated their husband. So we can speculate that becoming a medium may have completed Xing Shi and helped give them the confidence to take command of their life really for the first time, after years of being controlled by and objectified and, and uh, abused by male sexual partners. Now, I should emphasize there's no way for us to know for sure the subjective consciousness or perception of these people who lived as women at enormous risk, whose gender crossing eventually attracted the malign attention of the Qing authorities. I think it's clear though that there was a huge gap between these individuals' motives and desires um, separating those motives and desires from the straight jacket of official expectations obsessed by the paradigm of the cross-dressing predator. That paranoid fantasy attempted to make sense of a gender performance that radically conflicted with normative masculinity. An ulterior motive explained it. The apparent embrace of femininity was in fact a disguise for that definitive form of dangerous masculinity, the aggressive penetrator who respects no ritual boundaries. So behind this veil of feminine artifice, Qing officials believed they saw the all too easily comprehensible threat of male sexual aggression. Ultimately then, the cross-dressing predator reflects anxiety less about gender inversion per se than about the vulnerability of chaste daughters and wives. Now, I realize I'm over time, but I have a bit of a, a coda about the contemporary scene. Is it okay? I mean, forgive me, I, I, I got off on a tangent. Okay, so in Asia today, although perhaps I should say before COVID, before the latest wave of, of um, policies under Xi Jinping, um, which seem to be rigidifying gender roles once again, there is or was a flourishing male to female trans culture. This culture features a certain refashioning and reinvention of traditional themes that circulate transnationally between within greater China, but also in Thailand, for example. So in China, what's interesting is that the renya, this term has become slang for a conventionally beautiful and glamorous trans woman. I should say it's also a term of abuse for gay men, but th what I'm talking about today is this conventionally beautiful and glamorous trans woman. So if you do a Google search of the term renya uh, in Chinese, it'll turn up many, many stories and images related to this, especially trans women from Thailand, 
where an M to F transgender culture is especially mainstream, focusing on high profile beauty pageants, such as Miss Tiffany's uniforms, universe. So this scene has attracted much fascinated attention in China and drag and trans women beauty pageants are now also performed in Taiwan, Hong Kong, and they were in the PRC until fairly recently. So in other words, the Renya is no longer a dangerous predator who targets chaste women. Instead, she is a Renzao Menyu, an artificial beautiful woman, that's the term of art, um, who performs to delight the male gaze. So the focus is the glamorous trans woman as performer. Um, and she generally conforms to the Bai Shou Mei ideal, right? The fair skin, thin, and pretty ideal. So um, the most famous uh, trans woman in China is Jin Xing, who until relatively recently was a celebrity on TV and so on. She's been kicked off TV and suppressed now. She doesn't fit in anymore, apparently. But she's probably the most famous trans woman in China. Um, there are others. There's uh, Liu Shihan, Shi Han, who is a fashion model. Um, has quite a package of endorsements. Um, so all of them are performers or entertainers of some kind, fashion models, actors, dancers, talk show hosts. Um, it's interesting that Liu Yifei, uh, who as far as I know is not trans, but she has been persistently rumored to have gone to America, to um, and she's actually a trans woman. There's this, and she actually had to deny this uh, publicly. Um, and uh, now you have the Si Da Hua Dan. This used to refer to male performers of female roles. Now it refers to beautiful young starlets, right? Um, and this makes me wonder whether achieving this Bai Shou Mei ideal to such a high degree is assumed to require so much artifice that transgender is automatically included as part of the equation. Now, the most famous Thai trans woman who's a celebrity in China, or at least used to be, uh, Trichata Pecherat, also known as Poid or Bar in Chinese, uh, she has a considerable following in greater China. She has starred in a number of Chinese films based in Hong Kong, um, including a horror thriller called Yao Yi, the English title is Witch Doctor. Yao is Ren Yao de Yao, Yao Yi. And um, this plays on traditional Chinese tropes of the randomly encountered beautiful woman being a potential sexual vampire, but also on the Hollywood trope of the trans woman as a potential serial killer. So this is a kind of mishmash of all these traditional but, but kind of Western and modern tropes all together. And these commentary, I just sort of pulled this off the web. This is like this passionate, fevered commentary. Bin yi ren gong yong yi ren wei. Tai guo zui dai mei ren yao. And then this one is interesting. So even straight men might become gay, right? And has even more feminine flavor than a, than a real woman. So if you look at this commentary, the underlying premise is that this is really a man who through artifice is performing as a, a female, and even better than a woman. So, I mean, and then here's more fevered commentary. We don't need to go into this. It's more of the same. Um, and here we have this uh, one generation. There are multiple generations of these. And here we have Liu Yifei, rumored. <laughs> as far as I know, it's not true, but who knows? Even the fox spirit, you have this sort of glamorous version of the fox spirit now, which strikes me as sort of the same by Shou Mei, right? Um, and so what am I getting at here? Um, this reinvented Ren Yao is no longer a hyper-masculine predator who threatens the chastity of women, right? Instead, she seems to evoke, invoke the idea of something fundamentally different, masquerading as a beautiful woman in order to bewitch men. She represents in this fantasy ideal, the performance of a certain kind of feminine artifice aimed at seducing the male gaze, at satisfying male possessive desire. And in this respect, she recalls the Qing Dynasty elite idealization of the actor who played female roles as the epitome of feminine beauty, superior to anything that a real woman, a mere woman could perform. So like the Dan, this version of the trans woman's allure depends precisely on their audience's awareness that they are not a cisgendered woman, right? But rather they are performing an ideal femininity achieved through artifice. Um, and again, this is like the Dan, bin yiren gong yon yiren wei, right? In both cases, it seems to me this kind of trans erotic allure is grounded in misogyny, right? Upon the part of those who are appreciating it. And it is these qualities in the Qing that made cross-dressing on stage safe and acceptable. It is also this quality, I think, that makes trans women acceptable in greater China today. 
Everyone understood the Dan rule to be temporary. Moreover, boy actors were owned by their masters. Their performance was not an exercise of choice. For individuals assigned male at birth in the Qing dynasty to choose to live as women as a transgressive act of self-determination, that was an entirely different matter. And Qing authorities could imagine no benign explanation or context for that kind of behavior, which they saw as self-debasing. In their eyes, that was a dangerous, malevolent fraud. And so in China today, gender crossing seems to be accepted and celebrated only in so far as it appeals to the male gaze in conformance with conventional standards of beauty and femininity. In effect, this reinforces those conventional standards. There are plenty of actual trans people who don't fit that image at all, right? Um, so it, in contrast with the ideal, trans women who fail to meet conventional standards of beauty are invisible, as are trans men. And in the new transgender glamour culture, there are no heroic celebrity trans men that I know of, right? So it's a particular subset. Anyway, I'm all done. I'm sorry to go on so long, but that's, that's what I've got. So thank you. Thank you.